Hello everyone and welcome to our very first Facebook Live here on Grandsnet. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, who is the author of this wonderful new book called The Four Pillar Plan, How to Relax, Eat, Move and Sleep. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rangan, thank you very much for, for coming in and, and, and being with us today. Um, yeah, we, we've, um, tell us a bit more about your book, I mean this is your very first book isn't it? Yes, well, Laura, thanks for having me on. It's a real pleasure to be here and speaking to everyone at Grandsnet. Um, this is my first book. I've been a doctor now for 16 and a half years. And during that time, I've seen tens of thousands of patients. And the majority of what I'm seeing, particularly these days, is in some way driven by the way that we're living our, our lifestyle. Now, I'm not putting blame on people, mm -hmm. but the way modern society is set up, it's having quite a negative impact on the way many of us feel. And this book really is my sort of, it's really my blueprint to counteract that. You know, I think when we concentrate on what I call the four pillars of health, food and movement, which mm -hmm. many people already think about, but also sleep and relaxation, I find that people can feel very quickly, you know, very, very quickly they can feel much better. And not only that, the changes that they make are, can be very sustainable. Mm. And I don't see, I see a lot of books out there, a lot of books that I love, but they focus on one area, like food. And food, you know, food is very important, but it's one component. Mm. You know, I've got patients recently who I've managed to help them lose weight or reverse their pre-diabetes and haven't really changed their diet. It's their stress levels that were actually causing them to hold on to their weight or it was their stress levels that were driving their type 2 diabetes. And, and that's actually why I start the book with the relaxation pillar, so the, the book is split up into four main areas, which correspond to the four, four pillars. pillars. Right? And in each of the pillars, mm -hmm. there's five chapters with a recommendation at the end of them. Mm -hmm. And it's not about perfection. It's absolutely not about having the perfect diet or the perfect movement regime. What it is about is about balance across all, five, uh, all four of those pillars. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, instead of scoring five in food and five in movement, I'd much rather score... I'd much rather people scored two in each of them with a total score of eight, the balance is much greater. Because you have these four pillars and then you have sort of objectives, don't you? You have sort of five, is it five sort of steps that are under each pillar that you should sort of try and attain, is that right? Absolutely. Now, the point is, though, it's not about perfection. It's certainly not about getting them all. I mean, yes. if you were to score all 20... <laughs> I, would, I, I would think that would be a challenge for me, I definitely think. I think it would be a challenge for anyone in yeah. the modern world, but... It's not really about scoring 20. In fact, I say in the book that for most of my patients, mm. most of the time, it's about 10 to 12 things yeah. they need to do and they start to feel considerably better. But for some people it will be less, and for some people it will be more. But the, the important thing is that these changes are, are achievable for every single person. Mm. You know, if, you, if you're a vegetarian or you're trying to go vegan, this book will work for you. If you like eating meats, this book will work for you. You know, no matter what you know, what your ethical or cultural choices are around the way you choose to live your life, you can personalise this plan for you. I, I'm, I'm very proud that I've written a book like that because, you know, I didn't want this just to be relevant for one segment of the population. Mm. You know, the young can listen and apply principles in this book, but if you're 50, 60, 70 years old, 80 years old, you can apply the principles in mm. this book. And, you know, that's really, you know something that's very dear to me as a doctor is to try and give health advice that's applicable for everybody. Yes. I really found that when reading the book, actually, is that it's very, it's very applicable to sort of anyone, really. Yeah, and it's not it's about... common sense. I think a lot of it's a lot of common sense, actually. It's a lot of common sense that I think is not that common anymore. Yes, and we've, no, we've you're lost right. in, in our... There's things we need to be reminded of. Exactly. And, and I was on uh, Radio 5 Live just a couple of days ago, and the DJ actually said, this is... It's, it's a great book. It's... it's, it's good common sense advice that applies to all of us with a modern twist yes. and, I, and I think he really summed it up really well there mm. it's got that modern it's really how do we live well with in, today's society. in today's society well, you mentioned the screen sabbath don't you that's one of the one of the ideas behind i can't remember which pillar it is the, the relax relaxation it, one i guess um and about um having one day off a week of, of a screen server than actually not turning on any screens or not watching any screens, which is... I don't know if you ever tried that, Lara. <laughs> no, I haven't. Or, uh, I don't know how I could, <laughs> yeah, well, so look, but I'm going to. <laughs> well, look, I can see you're getting anxious thinking about yes. it, and many people will. So th this is not a prescriptive book. No, it's, it's about saying if a whole day without your screens is too much for you, yeah. you know what, start with an hour. 
But just being aware of the fact that you should actually step step back for a bit. Yeah, it's just, you know, I, my wife and I, with our kids, on a Sunday morning, we often try and do the park run. Mm -hmm. And we've started, you know, a few months ago, we started going to the park run with the kids. And we'd often hang out in the park for a couple of hours afterwards without our phones. But it's like a different experience. Mm -hmm. We're more present. We feel, you know, you get back home and you see your phone, you feel like you've had a holiday. Yeah. And I have done it on several days. I've done it, you know, one day a week, no screens at all. No, no, and when I say screens, I'm talking about smartphones, laptops, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of thing. You know, TV not so much, mm -hmm. although that would be great as well. And you feel like you've had a holiday. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's stats saying that we touch our phone over 200 times a day. We, we look at our phone. Yeah. It's really remarkable. And so... This is not about me telling people you need to be doing this. It's about saying, look, you may find this useful. Why not give it a go? Mm. Um, you know, Lauren, one thing I was thinking that might be useful for, you know, the, the, the people who follow the Grand's Net page mm. is strength training. Mm -hmm. You know, is something that's very much neglected. It's one of the questions actually did come up on the, on the forums. Yeah, someone asked about this is uh, specifically asked you about strength training actually, and, and what what sort of exercises you would recommend. Yeah, so the thing about strength training, it's really important to understand, is that our lean muscle mass is one of the strongest predictors of how well we're going to be in later life. Right, it's really really strongly correlated between you know having a high quality of life when you're older. Mm. And here's the thing: once you get past the age of thirty, every ten years. If we're not doing enough, we can lose. As you that. Yeah, as you said, we lose about five percent okay. of our muscle mass every ten years. Well, that's a lot. It has mm. significant uh, consequences for our health. And actually, I th I think that, that the older we get, the more we have to prioritise strength training. We associate it with twenty year olds and thirty year olds, mm. don't we? We associate it with you know people trying to look buff in their yes. in, in their younger yes. age groups. But actually, it's more important, and that's why. A few years ago, I created something called a five-minute kitchen workout. And oh. I detail it in the book, and it, it's been a hit with my patients. So this, this is really about removing obstacles for people to actually do strength training. Because for many people, the gym is an expense. Mm -hmm. It's far away from where they live. It's a reason not to do it, because yes. it's a bit of a hassle. Yes. And some people feel self-conscious mm -hmm. about going to a gym with lots of fit people there. Mm. So I thought, okay, well, how can, I, how can I encourage my patients to do it? And I've got patients doing this who are 20, I've also got patients who are 80 years old doing it because the whole workout can be modified to your strength and your mobility levels. Oh, that's great. So it's, you know, let's say, um, if I had a couple just a few months ago in their early 60s and they came to see me, they had some general health, health problems and I thought strength training would be really useful for them. So I taught them how to do this kitchen workout, which is, you know, press-ups, mm. but press-ups quite a challenging exercise to do them on the floor, but you can do them against a wall. Yes. You know, most of us can do that it against the wall. Easier, yes. So, so with this couple, we started it against the wall. Mm -hmm. I taught them how to do some calf raises by holding onto the kitchen worktop. I taught them how to do some just tiny squats while holding onto their, their oven handle. Oh, okay. Right. So it's the kind of thing you can do when you, the kettle's boiling or whatever. You exactly. can sort of put this in any and, time. And they were very skeptical. And I said, guys, five minutes twice a week. Do you think mm. you can commit to that? I said, yeah, okay, we'll try. Excellent. Four weeks later, they were doing this workout in their landing upstairs while their bath was running six nights a week. Oh my goodness. It was wow. fun. You know, transformed. Yeah, you don't need to get changed, yeah. right? You don't need to buy any equipment. It's a small... Yeah, yeah, and that's that's why I, I created it. I, I made a video as well, which might be worth you know pointing yes, your, your views in the right direction. It's on my website. It shows the video of how you can do it. Mm. And so I would say strength training is very very important as we get older. Excellent. And um, also, if uh, for anyone who's just joined us, um, we have got two signed copies um, of the book to give away. So please do add a question, share, um, and like our page, and um, we'll be giving away two of those copies um, at the end. Fantastic. Um, so, do you think, as a, as a nation, we just we're not moving, we're not exercising enough? I think generally we're not moving enough. You know, mm. our lives are very sedentary these yes. days. I think you know it's probably the the first time in our evolution where we can get food to our house by just tapping a few things on our screen. Mm. You know, with online supermarket yes. oh, deliveries. Yes, time you absolutely. Know. So convenient, isn't it? Yeah, it really is, and you know, we use it at home mm. as well. So I'm not. I'm again, I'm not criticising. Yes. I'm just saying that these are things that are having an impact on our lives. And that's why the movement suggestions mm. are very simple. They're very actionable. Yes. You know, one of them is 
try to get 10,000 steps a day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now look, many people now have got a phone, a smartphone. That tracks your steps. It's such a simple barometer that we can all use as a way of just seeing, are we getting there? And I've got some patients, you know, just about two months ago, you know, I had a, I had a lady in her 50s. She loved that. And she would check before dinner every night how many steps she'd done. Mm. And sometimes she was at 8,000. And she'd go, all right, you know what? I'm going to leave dinner. I'm going to go and have a, oh, go for a walk. Back. So good. We've actually, on, on Grounds, there's, a, there's a, a thread on 10,000 steps and actually people come on and say, oh, I've got my 10,000 steps today, or I haven't, or, you know, they sort of, yeah. you know, peer support there. And it's not about nice. telling people off, right? If no. people can't do it, I get it. Yeah. That's absolutely Everyone fine. Everyone sets their own limits. Yeah, and, and the point of this book is that there's five recommendations in each pillar. Mm. You don't need to do them all. Mm. You know, if 10,000 steps doesn't work for you, you know, choose another one. Mm. Choose another one. Do the five-minute kitchen workout twice a week. I say you just got to do it twice a week. Mm. I mean, who hasn't got five minutes twice a yeah. week you to work on that? Much? Exactly. But if I say you've got to go to the gym for one hour four times a week, yeah. how many people are going to do that? No, it's, it's and, and that's why I think this book is resonating with so many people because it's it's simple, it's achievable. But these these are the principles that I use. Mm. Every day in my practice with my patients, mm -hmm. these are principles I try and apply with myself and my family. And actually, these are the principles that, for, for those of you who, who did watch the Doctor in the House series, mm. these are the principles I use to help reverse type 2 diabetes, reverse menopausal symptoms, mm -hmm. reverse a 30 year history of back pain. There's a really nice section here called Wake Up Your Sleepy Glutes, which is how our bottom muscles have gone to sleep because of the way we're living. Sitting down all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, it's a, these really great exercises that were taught to me by the, the person who cured my back pain after 10 years of searching for a solution, a guy mm. called Gary Ward. We've helped create four exercises for the book that take two minutes to do. Mm. And I do them every morning while my coffee is brewing. Excellent. I just do my glute exercises every morning. So there you go. We can all fit it into our daily routines. And that's the point, <laughs> is so that people can do it. Yeah. I don't want to write a book that just. You know, for 10 days people looked at it and put it on the shelf. Yes. Right? I wanted something that's applicable not only in January, but also in March, yes. in August, and next Christmas hopefully as yes. well. So should we, should we start looking at some of the questions that people are asking sure. on, um, so what would the ideal recommendation, um, recommended amount of sleep for someone in their 50s, Sue asks? Hi Sue, well the first thing I'll say about sleep is mm -hmm. in the book there's something called a rate questionnaire, which is a simple way of, of you know, basically trying to figure out what is your sleep health like. Now, I don't give a number. My definition of good sleep is, you know, do you wake up feeling refreshed? Do you wake up at roughly the same time each morning? It will take 30 minutes without an alarm clock. Mm -hmm. And also, can you get to bed within about half, can you get to sleep within about half an hour of, of trying to in the evening? If you're doing those three things well, I think your sleep is probably in good shape. If you're not, then the tools in this book are basically going to help you. Mm. Because in 16 and a half years of seeing patients, for the majority of people, now not everyone, for the majority of people, if they're having trouble sleeping, they are doing something in their everyday lifestyle that they don't realise is having a negative impact mm. on the way that they're sleeping at night. Okay. And lots of people are looking for that. You know, what's the over-the-counter pill I can take? Mm. What's the sleeping pill that's going to help? But often, it's simple things. I'll give you an example. Um, one of the tips in, um, in the Four Pillar Plan is called embrace morning light. Right? So going outside in the morning, exposing yourself to natural light. I know today's a pretty good day out there. It's easier <laughs> to do. I get that. But you expose yourself to natural mm. light. That helps set your body's circadian rhythm, which is your natural daily rhythm. That helps you sleep in the evening. But people often don't think about that. So mm. just getting outside in the morning and exposing yourself to yes, that natural light. You don't think it has anything to do with it, do you? Exactly. It reduce your caffeine intake, perhaps. But yes, and caffeine is another one. And mm. I tell you, particularly in the, the 50 plus age group, I see this a lot. And I had a long chat with my mother about this recently. Um, you know, I thought caffeine might be affecting her sleep. And she said to me, "Wrong. Well, look, I've, I've been, you know, I've been having a cup of tea at 4 p.m. You know, for years. You know, that doesn't affect my sleep." And she wouldn't listen to me, you know, and I, and I understand that, you know, you, we, don't, we don't listen to things from those closest to us, do we? Um, but you know what? She's cut it out now and she's sleeping because it may be that you got away with it when you were younger. And now she has to make changes. Exactly. Yeah. And I find that, you know, caffeine afternoon 
it's amazing how many times that impacts our ability to sleep in the evening. It really is, and people don't think about it. No, you sort of think maybe sort of after six or you know sort of in the evening, but not actually as early. Yeah, because as caffeine's, as well. caffeine lingers in your body for mm. quite a long time afterwards, and so it really can help very quickly. Mm -hmm. The other thing, particularly these days, is about light. Mm -hmm. Right? If you think about it, the way we've evolved. Bright light in the morning would get us up out of bed mm. and it would be dark in the evening. Mm. And that when the light goes down, our melatonin levels, which are a hormone in our body, go up mm. and that helps us fall asleep. Well, what's interesting, if you look at an iPad like this mm -hmm. or we're looking at our phones in the evening, it, it emits something called blue wavelength light and that switches off, that, that, that reduces the amount of melatonin we produce. So think about this for a minute. If we, if we were talking about a drug that reduced the melatonin levels, that mm. wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it would affect our sleep. You know, we'd be talking about it saying, that's got really bad side effects. But that's what these devices are doing to us. So I've got a strategy in the book called a No Tech 90. Mm -hmm. It's this whole idea that for 90 minutes before bed, we basically switch up all technology. Yes. And it's Good amazing. Advice, yeah. And you know what, if 90 minutes is too much, start off with half an hour. Yeah. Move it up to 60 minutes. It's not a prescription, it's just some helpful tools and I've got a, I've got a chap, an, an IT manager in his late 40s who has only slept three to four hours a night for about 20 years. And basically within a month I had him sleeping seven hours a night. And it's basically, by applying the principles in this book, it was switching off in the evening, yeah. switching off his work email, switching off technology. And that actually, made that much difference. And an adult colouring book. Oh really? Yeah. Oh. Remarkable, because he couldn't switch his mind off. So you need another activity. So, yeah, so for him, and again, there's a ton of strategies in the book. That may not be the right one for you or for me, but for him, actually going into this colouring book, mm. it switched his mind off. So, you know, it's amazing. There's so many little simple hacks that we can yes. use to get us feeling well, better. We have loads of people wanting more and more. Well, to, far so away. We've got tons and tons of, of questions coming in. So, uh, Carol asks, do you have a view on taking probiotics for gut health? And how do we identify the best products to take? That's a great question. So the first thing I'd say is that, look, the health of our gut, we know, is critical for not only the way we feel in our tummy and our bowel, but the way we feel for our whole body. So we know that when our gut is in good shape, mm. our mood is affected, our skin can be affected, our energy levels can be affected. Mm. It's remarkable. We've got these trillions of bugs that live inside us, and, and the health of those bugs and the relationship of those bugs with each other impacts our overall health. So the best way to change the health of your gut bugs is to change your diet. And that's why one of the suggestions is five different vegetables per day, mm -hmm. and if you can, different colors. Because uh, what, what, yeah, it's a really yeah. simple way. And, and actually what I do with my family at home, we've got a little rainbow chart on the fridge, and we, we tick it off each night to see, you know, his mummy, his daddy, we all got our colors. And actually my son last night, he realised he hadn't ticked off the red colour. So we went to the fridge, got out his red pepper, we cut it and he had half a red pepper. So it, it makes it a fun game. He? He's seven years old. Goodness but you know, I'll tell you why. <laughs> because we make it a part a of our activity, life. We make yes. it a fun activity. And we all do it together. Yeah. So it's not me saying, oh, yes. you guys have got to eat your veg while daddy does something yes, different. Yes, yes. We all have to participate. Yeah. But as to probiotics, here's the thing. Some probiotics can be incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. There's no question. And some of my patients in my surgery... In the short term, I do use probiotics sometimes to help you know, speed up the whole process. Ultimately, we'd love it. I would love it if we could do it all from our diet. Mm -hmm. But I get it. Modern life is busy. Sometimes we can't always make the best choices. Probiotics, you've got to ask around a little bit. You know, as a doctor, it's very hard for me to recommend a brand. Yeah. Um, but there are some really good quality products. And talk to a healthcare professional. Maybe talk to your doctor or you know, uh, nutritional therapists can be to very useful specific needs. Yeah, to, to ask what might help you, but also there's a lot of bad products out there as well. But, you know, I do use probiotics with my patients. I've used them with my children in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and, a, and a useful tip is, you know, and something they do in Europe a lot is if you take antibiotics, mm -hmm. they get given probiotics That's with good. them. Yes. We don't do that here. Yeah. But if I was going to take an antibiotic, I would absolutely take a probiotic called 
Saccharomyces boulardii with it. Okay. And that's a yeast type probiotic that's actually oh, wow, used a lot in Europe. So it's just a little tip there for yeah. people. Good. We have got loads of questions, so I'm going to, uh, you know, we're going to carry on. Do you want me to give shorter answers? Yes, give me shorter answers. Okay, I'll try and great. give shorter answers. <laughs> yes, I'm just, I just really want to explain so them. Much to say, isn't there? Um, I have rheumatoid, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. What do you advise for exercise? Annoyingly, I don't like swimming. Ask Trish. Yeah, that, that's a, you know, the thing about activity is it's got, we've got to find something that you can do without experiencing much pain. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't like swimming, I'd probably say it's probably not the best exercise for you because if you don't like it, even if you manage to go once or twice, you're never going to do it long term. I mean, what is it? Try and think about what do you love doing? Is it a bit of dancing? You know, is putting some music on and doing some sort of dancing at home going to help you feel better? Is it going for a walk? And, and it also depends what you can do around your pain threshold. And mm -hmm. so it can be quite challenging that. The more, you know, if you can get more active, and walking is as good as anything, mm -hmm. you know, that's the reality. And I, I tell you one thing it's worth saying for rheumatoid arthritis. It's an autoimmune condition, but I have seen that even with patients with moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis, when they start making changes in their lifestyle, so sometimes changing their diet significantly mm. can improve their pain level so they can then do more activity. Mm. I've got a patient recently and that is exactly what happened with mm. her. I'm not talking about reversing the condition, I'm saying the principles in this book can improve how good you feel, which will mean you're more likely to be able to do more activity. So I hope you find that useful. Okay, thank you. Um, Kim asks, how do, you, how do you recommend that we approach loved ones who we would love to be a lot healthier? I have my mum who's almost 70 and friends just over 30 who could all benefit from more balance and a healthier lifestyle, but I don't know how to approach them without sounding patronising. It's tricky. Kim, I think that's such a fantastic <laughs> question. That's something I've wrestled with for the past few years because once I started going around the world to learn from the best experts to learn how how we can use lifestyle to help improve our health specifically you know I wanted to shout it from the rooftops tell my friends tell my parents tell my wife mm -hmm. but you know what it can be hard to tell the people closest to you because it can sound preachy you know people will make these choices when they're ready mm -hmm. look I would say to you and I'm not, I'm not saying this for my book but if you've got a favourite book out there that you think has helped you, I'd just get that and give that to your, to your family because ultimately it always comes across better from someone else rather than you. And that's been my experience. By all means, I know we want to, we want to help those, those, those people closest to us, but it can be hard. I'll tell you recently what happened to me is uh, my mother wasn't doing so well with her health and she said to me, she said, well, look, how come you're helping all these people on Doctor in the House around the country but you can't help me? Mm -hmm. I said, Mum, it's because you're my mum and you're not doing the things that I'm asking you to do <laughs> in the same way that those people are. And, and so I think I, I, I struggle with that as well. And I found that actually one, one, of the, one of the best bits of feedback I've had in the last week since this book's been out, mm -hmm. so many people have tweeted me or on Facebook said, you know what, I love it. I'm actually just going to get a copy for my mum or for my sister or for my colleague at work. Mm -hmm. So so many people are buying like three or four copies to give out mm -hmm. because it's them you know, it's them getting advice from a doctor. And not from you. Not and from not from you yes. with, with this sort of experience to say, hey, look, this is going to help. Yes. So I hope you find that useful. Okay. The other thing I'd say is actually, mm. instead of telling them what to do, just when they're with you, why not lead by example? You know, mm. do, you know do the thing. So, so this is what I learned with our kids at school, mm. you know, over the last years, because I struggle with how much sugar is given to kids in our yes. modern society. It's something as too, with two young kids myself, I, tr I really try and mm. fight against. And so what we do is like when my, when my kids are on school trips, my wife makes these little fruit kebabs. They're really colourful, they don't take long to make, and we send them in, and the kids then have that when their friends are having their sugary treats on their, on their trips out. And the teacher said to us last time, said, that's such a great idea, we're gonna start doing that for all the kids. And that taught me a very important lesson, which is nobody likes to be told what to do. But if you're doing things that you regard as healthy and they see you doing them, I think they're much more likely to respond than if you tell them, oh, you should be doing this, yeah, mum, you should be doing that. Interesting. Oh, good for the teachers. That's great. Yeah, really so great. So we've got our final three questions. I've only got a few minutes in. Um, so this one's got to do with, with um, both water intake and sleep. And I know sleep was a real issue for a lot of the grants that users on the forum. Um, uh, insomnia is, is, is obviously a big problem. Um, so, our uh, Grandsit user Apple Grand says, I have to get up two or three times in the night to go to the loo. I'd love to get up less often and have a better night's sleep. How much fluid is too much? 
in a typical day? Yeah, that's a really good question because it's very hard. Uh, the thing I found hardest about writing a book was to give generalised mm. recommendations because I personalise things quite a lot in my practice with my patients. So if you're getting up at night and you need to use the bathroom, the simplest way to try and avoid that, and, I, and I get, you may well have tried this, is to stop drinking earlier. So, mm. you know, front load your fluid intake, have it in the morning, have mm. it in the afternoon. Once you get to sort of late afternoon, be quite cautious because then you've got enough time for the fluids to come in and fill your, you know, fill mm. up in your bladder. Yes. Have you to use the bathroom before you go to bed. So that can be a simple tip. I do like the tip, um, it, it, I, I call it drink more water. It's a very simple recommendation, but I find many people these days are simply not drinking enough and so many problems like headaches, mm. stomach ache, constipation, sometimes you know feeling we're hungry mid-afternoon or mid-morning, actually it's just a sign oh, that we're, we're not thirsty. So a simple thing I do is say, look, when you wake up, have two glasses of water, mm -hmm. two big glasses of water, halfway through the morning and halfway through the afternoon, have another big glass of water and you're in pretty good shape. You've done most of it, yeah. Yeah, so I'd say, you know, and, and I, I do say, I think for most people, about 1.2 litres is a good amount. That's eight small glasses of water, okay. right? But again, if you're getting up at night, front load it. Don't have those in the evening. Mm. So I hope you find that useful. Yes, because maybe what she's probably doing is thinking, well, I haven't had enough water today and sort of drinking a lot nearer the end of the day. Yeah. So the very last question this is, um, so this is about HRT. I'd like to ask how safe it is for me to continue with HRT over 60. My doctor is making noises about taking me off it, which fills me with a sense of dread. Yeah, so that's, that's quite a complex question because there are different kinds of HRT, hormone replacement therapy, and there are risks and side effects that have to be balanced against your own personal family history. So it's quite hard for me to give individualised advice. But one thing I will say is that hormone replacement therapy can be useful for symptom control in many patients with menopausal symptoms, but I have helped many patients get rid of their menopausal symptoms by making changes with their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Because the thing is, in, in, if you've got menopausal, uh, menop symptoms of the menopause, that's something to do with something called estrogen and progesterone. These are the female, what we call the sex hormones. Mm -hmm. But they don't work in isolation. Our adrenal glands and our stress levels absolutely impact, basically, um, the, the production of estrogen and progesterone and how they interact with us in the body. So. A recent example, which is a good one to use, is actually in the first season of Doctor in the House, which I think is still on YouTube somewhere, actually, you can probably see this, is a lady, I think she was 48 at the time, she scored 15 out of 17 on the British Menopausal Society Symptom Questionnaire. So really severe symptoms. Her doctor had recommended she go on HRT, and she didn't want to. So she came to see me, and within four weeks, we got it down from 15 out of 17 down to two out of 17, okay? No hormones. And how we did that was I taught her how to switch. Her mind was go, go, go the whole time. Mm -hmm. She was completely stressed. We changed her diet, which had an impact on her hormones. Mm -hmm. She took a bath every evening. She had 15 minutes every evening where she would just chill out and listen to music. Mm -hmm. And she was doing 10,000 steps a day. That was it. Yeah. Quite simple in isolation. And in four weeks, oh, and she took some magnesium in the evening. Now, I haven't gone into supplements in the book mm -hmm. for a reason, but for some people, magnesium can help them switch off and help them relax a bit more. So that's all I did with her. So this is someone who was told to go on hormones, mm. but she didn't need, A, she didn't want to, and B, by, by adopting lifestyle changes, she, she managed to get them under control. So I'd say... The, avoid the medication. Yeah, so I'd say, look, I'm sure your GP's got your best interests at heart if, you, if, if your GP wants to take you off the hormones. Mm -hmm. So you can actually start applying the principles in this book to actually get your body in a much better state. If you do decide to come off them, I think you'll be able to actually respond and bounce back quite strongly mm -hmm. if you try and dial in the other aspects of your lifestyle. So I hope you find that useful, but do have that frank discussion with your GP. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I think that's all, that's all the questions I think we're going to have time for today. So a few final things, that, uh, Grant, that we'd like to ask you. And the first thing is, uh, what three tips do you have um, to get healthier this year? You should sort of narrow it down to three. Narrow things. it down. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you three four quick, tips. Oh, so I'll tell three you why. Pillars. There's four <laughs> pillars. I'm going to give you a tip from each pillar. Okay. okay? Re in relaxation, I'd say have 15 minutes to yourself every day with no phone. Okay, something you love and do it by yourself. Okay, that's tip number mm -hmm. one. Tip number two is the, uh, the food pillar. 
eat all of your food within a 12 hour window. Okay, so that would be breakfast at 8 a.m. and finish eating by 8 p.m. So you don't have to change what you eat, just when you eat. So you have a fasting period. Yeah, it's just 12 hours a day. And mm -hmm. You're sleeping for most of that. Mm -hmm. And it can help you lose weight, it can help your immune system. It's, it's incredible what it does. So that's a simple tip. Mm -hmm. Movement, mm -hmm. I'd say do my five minute kitchen workout twice a week, that's all. That's all I'm asking of you, 10 minutes a week, if you can spare me that. Okay, fair enough. Okay. And the fourth tip regarding sleep, I'd say, is switch off all technology 90 minutes before bed and no tech 90. Is that okay, Laura? One yes. tip from each pillar? Yes, I'll do my best. Yeah? <laughs> can you, can you commit to some of those? <laughs> it's a 90 minutes before bed. That's a technology thing. 60 <laughs> minutes? I'll do my best. All right, 30 minutes? All right, I'll start with 30. Start I'll, with I'll 30. work it out. I'll, I'll work it out. Okay. I'll get, I'll get to 90. Get to 90. <laughs> and then let me know how you get on. Um, and also, Fatty, do you have any New Year's resolutions that you've made for 2018? New Year's resolutions. You know what? The thing I'm struggling with, um, and I, I love this four pillar framework as a way that we can all assess our own health. Mm -hmm. So if I look at those four pillars in me, I think the one I need the most work in at the moment is relaxation. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got a busy job, I've got two young kids, I've got all this book, book promotion uh -huh. to, to, to do at the moment. So I'm, I'm around the country sort of talking about this because I really think this can transform people's lives. I'm struggling to switch off mm -hmm. and I know I need to prioritize relaxation. So the last okay. five days now, I've got this uh, app on my phone called Calm. Mm -hmm. It's a meditation app and I plug it in for 10 minutes every morning and it's a guided meditation. And it's really helping me cope with all these stresses. So, you know, more relaxation mm -hmm. is basically what I need to do. Fair enough. Well, thank you so much for coming in today. We've really enjoyed having you. Um, and just to remind everyone, this is um, Dr. Chatterjee's The Four Pillar Plan, um, which is available at the moment. Thank you so much. No problem. <laughs> these are the ones we're going to sign for people. And these are the ones we're going to sign. Um, so if you have commented on our Facebook um, Live today, then you'll be in with a chance of, of, um, of winning one of these. Signed copies. Bye. Thank you very much.